Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our webinar this morning. Um, we're going to be talking to Simply VAT and intercultural elements this morning. Uh, we've got Alex Wyatt from Simply VAT and Jesse Rag from Intercultural Elements. Morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Great, thanks for joining us. Um, so the, the way that we're going to work this morning, I'm literally, um, obviously, for those of you who don't know, I'm uh, Lorna from GS1 UK. I'm literally just going to do a very super quick introduction, um, and then I'm going to pass straight into the meaty details over to Alex. Um, just to let you know, a bit of housekeeping, I will be recording the session, so we will be sharing the recording after it, in case that you missed any slides or you want any extra information from those. Um, and then uh, if you guys have got any questions, pop them in the chat box. Uh, make sure that it, the audience is to all. Um, that way we can all pick them up and we can uh, address any questions throughout the presentation if they're relevant. Otherwise, we will wait for some Q&A at the end of the session. So uh, let's get straight to it. So for those of you guys um, that don't know GS1, uh, we are GS1 UK here in England. Um, we're a community of businesses, so we're a membership organisation that has over 2 million companies around the world. Here in the UK, we've just reached the milestone of 36,000 businesses. They do range from uh, big guys all the way up to the, the global sort of uh, Tesco's of the world, all the way down to the sole traders. Um, our job here is predominantly to license the GTIN, so the, the number that sits below the barcode, to help prod people uh, identify their products uh, and get them ready for trade. Um, and as you can see there, more than 6 billion barcodes are read across the planet every single day. So um, we've got quite a good penetration across the planet and uh, we're a not-for-profit, so we're a big community um, helping to make businesses work together. Um, the contact details are on the slides, just in case you have got any questions or you would like to know more. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Alex uh, from Simply VAT. Uh, there you go, Alex. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my name is Alex Wyatt. I am the head of business development here at Simply VAT, um, and we help e-commerce traders sell internationally um, by looking after their VAT registrations and returns and any obligations that they have. So um, today I'm going to provide a bit of an educational overview of um, VAT and what your obligations are when trading in Europe. So I'm going to start with what is VAT. So VAT is value added tax and it's added at every step of the supply chain. So from the raw uh, materials to the supplier or to the manufacturer to then the wholesaler um, and so on all the way to the end customer. So the standard rates across the EU vary between 17% to 27%. Um, and it's favored in over 140 countries worldwide uh, because governments get revenue every step of the supply chain. But it's not supposed to be a burden on businesses. So um, you as a business, if you're VAT registered, you can actually reclaim all of your VAT paid. Um, it will get offset against the sales VAT on your VAT return. So the e-commerce um, world has kind of exploded over the last uh, well, in recent years. So it, in 2016, there were sale, global online sales of 18 trillion pounds. And 10% of that was cross-border trade. And looking at UK uh, traders specifically, 27% of them are selling into the EU mainland. So there really is lots of opportunity and growth to be had still. So when you're looking um, into expanding internationally, uh, there's many things that you need to think about, such as payment processing, um, pricing, fulfillment, culture and language, which Jesse will touch on. Um, but then there's also the many different variations of VAT. So you have your VAT returns, um, different local laws and regulations, um, and it really gets down into the nitty gritty like interest at and VAT recovery. So in saying that, um, many companies have a head down in the sand approach, um, but that's not actually a long-term sustainable solution. As we're seeing recently, uh, the tax authorities in the UK, Germany, and so on are really clamping down on online sellers because they're losing billions in, uh, in VAT. So it, it's not a sustainable long-term uh, business approach. 
So when looking um, into selling to private customers cross-border, uh, you must be VAT registered if you're holding your stock within an EU country. Different rules may apply um, if you're a UK-based business and you're holding your stock in the UK. You have up until £85,000 uh, within, a, within a 12 month time frame uh, before having to VAT register. After that, when you're selling cross-border, you're covered by the distance selling rules. So these rules apply if you are selling on marketplaces, if you're a registered business, um, and even if um, even if you're registered for VAT or not in the UK. So um, it is important to understand what these rules are. So the distance selling rules are where you're holding your stock in one EU country and you're charging local VAT from that country until you exceed a set threshold within a calendar year. So at the end of the calendar year, your thresholds go back down to zero if you haven't exceeded. If you do exceed the threshold within a calendar year, uh, you must VAT register from that point um, and then you will have to continue paying that, uh, the new inbound country's VAT rate and um, from there. So the thresholds are 35,000 euros in most EU countries or, or the, their uh, currencies equivalent. Um, but in Germany, Netherlands and Luxembourg, it's about 100,000 euros. So you do have a, a quite a good buffer um, in order to you know, start your international expansion without having to, um, to put up the cost of compliance from there. So if you fail to register uh, in these countries once you cross over your thresholds, it could result in significant penalties, um, late payment fines, and also marketplaces may shut down your accounts. Um, so it is important to make sure that you are you're understanding uh, when you're crossing over the thresholds and monitoring these sales so that you can be um, on, uh, have a proactive approach to your compliance. And so ignorance is no defense. Um, in 2012, all the EU tax authorities put together a mutual cooperation to combat the lost uh, VAT revenue. Uh, so they do talk to each other and they do share data. So it is important that you are, um, you are making sure that you are complying in each country and that every step of your VAT obligations are being traced so that it's, it's quite a smooth, um, I like to call it a process flow, so everything is tracked along the way. Um, also, there's been new special um, legislation being put in place, especially in the UK and now coming into Germany, uh, where tax authorities are pursuing e-retailers. Um, so it is really important that you are aware of where you're holding your stock or if you're crossing over those thresholds. So going back to the um, difference in the VAT rates, uh, in the UK it's 20%, but in Hungary, the most expensive one is 27%. So if your total price, including VAT, is £28.80, then your net price would be £20, um, as the VAT rate would be 20%. In Hungary, uh, your net price would then be 18.68 because you're now paying six pound uh, 12 in VAT. So it is really important to understand um, if your pricing can include all the different variations of VAT rates. And if it can't, then you need to make sure that you're uh, making those changes in your pricing when you start crossing over the thresholds. So this slide is um, explaining the distance selling thresholds. So here, the ones in red, you've crossed over the threshold and now you're gonna be um, accounting for the VAT rate for that country. So in Belgium, you're charging 21%, Hungary, 27%, and Spain, you're charging 21%. In Germany, you haven't quite, quite crossed over the threshold, so you're still charging the UK VAT at 20%. And same thing with Poland, um, you're still charging it at 20% until you cross over that threshold. So if you're selling medium to high value goods, it can be quite easy to trip over these lines. So if you're selling uh, watches, cameras, any technology, that's really simple to, to cross over. It's done on uh, the distant selling thresholds are calculated based on the net price. So it's excluding VAT, um, but it is, it's, calculated on the net sale price, not the cost value of it. So if you do, um, if you are selling, you know, products for a thousand, it could only take 
35 products to trip over that line. So the next thing we're seeing is a lot in the BAT world is that a lot of sellers are using the Amazon fulfillment programs um, and they're not understanding where they're holding their stock because Amazon, they pick a box, um, which could be the Pan EU box, and um, it signs them up to hold their stock in seven EU countries. So that then um, triggers seven VAT obligations because holding your stock within an EU country triggers a VAT obligation um, as your stock becomes a taxable supply. So it is really important to make sure you understand exactly where your stock is being held and that if you are using different fulfillment programs like Amazon offers, you understand exactly what that entails and what your obligations are. So if you're moving your stock into German fulfillment center, for example, you will need a German VAT registration. And then any sales from Germany will then um, include the German VAT rate, which the standard rate is 19%. Now, if you're exporting into the EU, or sorry, into outside the EU, um, everything will be zero rated because everything um, exported outside is considered um, an export and it's uh, not taxable. So can you afford to sell into Europe as a seller? Um, you just need to make sure that you're factoring in the cost of compliance like you would um, as every other step of the supply of your supply chain. Make sure you're factoring in. If you're going to use a tax agency such as ourselves, you're factoring in that cost of compliance into your margins. And make sure you're planning um, and preparing. So if you are going to cross over set thresholds or starting to expand into other EU countries, make sure you're aware of what that, um, that obligations you have alongside not only the language and culture barriers, but um, this is it's really important because this can be detrimental to your business. But with that being said, there is loads of opportunity when selling cross-border and there's loads of profit to be had. Um, so really the question is, can you afford not to sell into Europe? So what we like to say here is don't let VAT be a barrier of your international expansion plans because it can be quite simple as long as you understand the basic rules. Um, and if you, if you need assistance, there is um, advice out there. You can come to us and talk to us and we'll be happy to help. And this is just going through what we do. We offer VAT registrations, returns, um, helping with any other further obligations. And you can follow us online. Ooh, sorry. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, I just got a couple of questions myself, actually. Um, thinking with a, a small business brain in terms of uh, the small businesses that we speak to here at GS1. How much does it cost to register for VAT? So um, this can vary depending on the country. So if you're a UK, um, it, it varies if you're a non-EU business and an EU business. Um, if you're a, specifically in an EU business, um, if you're registering abroad for, say, our uh, costs would be £299 for a registration. Um, and that covers all the preparation. We do all the preparation work um, and then liaise with the tax authorities and handle any of the translations with those um, documents. Great. And roughly how long would it take? Is it, is it kind of, when you're talking about preparation, is it kind of, I've got to realise, oh, it's going to be a month to register or is it quite it, quick? Yeah, it can take a while to register, um, especially with, you know, the volume, since the tax authorities have really started to crack down on the online sellers, a lot of, they've seen an influx of um, people trying to register. So when looking at, um, you know, taking the time to register, it it can take anywhere between four up to 10 weeks um, to get a registration in place, depending on the country. So um, in France specifically, it's taking closer to the 10 weeks. Um, so it, we like to say, once you get in um, about the 10,000 euro buffer, when you're approaching your threshold within about 10,000 euros, it's good to start planning and, and looking into different, uh, looking into your VAT obligations at that point because uh, it will take some time to get the, the VAT registration into place. Great, okay, thank you for that. Right, Jesse, we're gonna pass over to you now. Cool. Brilliant. So just double checking that you can, sh that you can see my screen there. 
Yep, all good. Off you go. Fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, that, um, as uh, as Lorna said, so I'm from Intercultural Elements. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I head up the sales team here. Um, we've just as a bit of an introduction, we're, we're actually based in Leipzig in Germany. So I'll apologise in advance if there's any sort of connection issues. I'm coming from across the pond. Um, but one thing that's really worth mentioning here is that we've been around for about 11 years. So we've worked with thousands of different retailers um, over the last decade to help with a variety of different expansion projects. Um, with a specific focus on marketplaces. So hopefully some of what I'll talk about today is useful for some of the retailers that are looking either to expand internationally or maybe trying to gross their presence across marketplaces, um, both in Europe and, and abroad, or and beyond, I should say. So yeah, as I said, we're based in Leipzig. We've got a team of about 60 people from 16 nationalities. And, and what we do is we try to bring the, uh, the cultural knowledge and cultural expertise when it comes to selling into a new country so that you're not having to try and guess how you should target to your sellers and uh, to your buyers in a particular country or region. Um, so we work with uh, we work in a number of different countries around the world. Um, in the majority of the major e-commerce countries uh, is where we really try to focus. Um, obviously, Amazon is, uh, is a powerhouse that's available in most of the countries that we work with, so that's one that we work with a lot, but we also try to help sellers get into marketplaces beyond Amazon as well. And so we do that through, um, through these three um, topics, building a strategy, implementing a strategy, and helping to maintain the success. So um, what I want to do is I want to try and share some of the insights that we've had over the last decade um, on these three sections to talk about how you can try and do that yourself or how you can find the right partners to work with to do that. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is building a strategy for expansion. Um, Alex already mentioned, you know, there's a lot of different things to consider, but I'm going to talk in particular about how to find which countries and marketplaces are the best ones for your products. Um, obviously, when you're looking at going international, you can go to a number of different countries and within each country, there's a number of different marketplaces that might work for you. Amazon's um, obviously a great one, but again, there's different marketplaces everywhere. So these four bullet points are things that we always encourage our clients to look at first. Where do you already get your orders from? If you've got just English listings or you're just uh, on Amazon UK or you've only got an English website, but you're getting orders from Germany, even though everything's not in, you know, nothing's in German, that's a really good indicator that you may be, you know, your prices are competitive enough in Germany with shipping that German buyers are willing to go through and buy everything even though it's not in their language. Um, another good thing to look at is where, what your competitors are doing. If your competitors are doing well or maybe not doing so well in a certain country, um, it's worth looking at whether or not you can repeat that success or beat the, you know, if they've not had any success, if you can do a better job than them. Another thing to look at is um, where your items or similar items are already being sold. Um, again, not to harp on about Amazon, but Amazon makes it easy here where the international Amazons, Amazon DE, FR, ESIT, for example, you can change the language to the low, uh, to English and then you can search for your items. So if you type in skipping rope or whatever you might be selling, Amazon will machine translate that for you and you get a bit of a feeling for how many other people are selling similar products. You can compare that with your price and get a feeling already of if you think you can compete on that. And of course, you can outsource this. There's a number of different tools out there um, that offer a variety of different um, a variety of different insights to different marketplaces in different countries. Um, there's services, there's machines, there's a whole bunch of different options that you can look at to do that. But this research um, is really the most important step, you know, before you go and just throw all of your products internationally and see what works and what doesn't. So when we look at available marketplaces, as I said, Amazon, eBay, they're, they're sort of everywhere. Um, but there's so many other marketplaces in different countries that can be good and can bring a new uh, level of, of ROI that you may not be able to get on the major marketplaces like Amazon and eBay. Um, there's other countries too where Amazon isn't even you know, an option. Sweden, for example, it's not there yet. Poland, it's not there. So you've got Allegro and Fitbit, for example, are two good marketplaces if you're looking to break into those areas. Again, you want to research not just which countries to go to, but what marketplaces you could and should be selling on there, um, where you're going to be competitive, what's going to work with your business model, um, and what the commission rates and everything are that can help you be profitable. 
So when it comes to implementing the strategy that you've put together, um, what I want to talk about today is translation and localization, and then how to set up and manage your listings across the marketplaces. So when it comes to translation and localization, one thing that I really don't like is, is Google Translate or machine translations in general, because what you've got is the, you run into the issue that it lacks the specificity that's needed for e-commerce. Um, when you spend that much time and effort building perfect titles, bullet points, descriptions throughout the process of creating your listings in English, you don't then want to trust a machine to do that for you. So, you know, regardless of how you get it translated, what's really important is the e-commerce specialization is there. This is an example um, that a client of ours was selling men's Under Armour t-shirts um, and Google literally translated it to Under Armour, so like chain mail. Um, which is obviously not great if you're trying to sell sports t-shirts. And so here's a few tips for balancing the translation quality and the cost. Um, as I said, no machine translations, it's, a, it's sort of a no-go when it comes to e-commerce, it, it doesn't work. Um, but one tip that I've really give you is to work out what actually needs to be translated. So when you're getting a quote for translations, make sure that the translators know if they need to translate the whole title, they need to know if you're selling a, if you're selling your own brand, they need to know what the brand is. You wouldn't translate the word Nike or Adidas, um, but if you're selling a private label brand that the, that the translator doesn't know what it is, you need to make sure that you're not being paid, you're not being charged to translate things that don't need to be translated. Again, it's also important to, in, to ensure that your um, translations are being done by someone with e-commerce experience so that you don't run into problems like character length, um, you know, where you turn an English title into a German title and it you know, gains an extra 15 characters in length and suddenly your titles are too long and Amazon rejects the listing. Um, so that's also something to factor in. Always proofread. Always ask um, if the prices for the translations include proofreading. And if they don't, you should make sure that you do have a native speaker to proofread the translations to make sure that there's not been any typos, and also to check that the flow of text is still there and that it's actually consistent with the message you're trying to deliver in English. Finally, don't be deceived by per word prices. Um, per word, just as a tip, per word is the industry standard for translations. And for any other industry, it works. Um, but when it comes to e-commerce, the chances are pretty high that you're going to have an, an, a lot of duplicate or repetitive text in your titles and bullet points and descriptions. If you've got a bullet point that is shown on 40% of your listings, you should only pay for that bullet point to be translated once. If you get a per word price, they're charging you every single time that you're paying for that bullet point to be translated. So again, you want to make sure that when you're getting the translation quotes and you're talking to companies about getting a translation, that they're factoring that into their pricing and making sure that you're getting duplicate text for free and that you're getting a discount on repetition. So if you've got men's red t-shirt and men's blue t-shirt, you're not paying twice for, for the uh, similar text there. And so separate to translation is localization. Um, it's quite common that the, that the words are used interchangeably, but actually localization is a completely separate thing. It's where you adapt your listings for the culture that you're selling to. Um, you know, the differences between British and American English alone, you know, with sneakers and trainers, pants and trousers, um, the word itself, spelling it with an S or a Z, these are just within the same language. As soon as you start going to other countries with other languages, this is where it becomes even more important. And of course, other than just words, it's also about making sure that your sizes, your measurements, your currencies and, and the terminology that you're using are being localized so that you don't end up with returns that are, you know, German buyers buying an item that's been advertised in English sizing and they've gotten confused. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you've got a good sizing chart that's there that shows accurate localization for the, for the sizes and everything so that you can try and minimize your returns. Um, and again, when it, comes to opt, uh, when it comes to categories, you want to make sure that you know how to put your item into the right category. What we in English might call shoes, um, some Germans would refer to certain shoes as boots. So again, it helps to have a, uh, a native speaker from the country actually assigning the categories for you when it comes to doing things like Amazon browse tree nodes um, to make sure that your items are showing up in the right categories so that 
if a buyer is not necessarily typing in the product, but they're using the search function on a marketplace, that your items are the ones that are showing up. Again, this comes to search terms. Don't just translate search terms, have a native speaker recreate them. The English word or the, the word that you're using in your own country for selling products um, that you think buyers in your country are typing in, a translated version of that word is not necessarily what the buyers are going to be typing in. There's totally different you know, uses for products in different countries. So if you're selling mouth guards in, in the UK, you'd be using search terms like rugby and hockey. But when you're selling to the US, you'd want to use football, American football, of course, or, or ice hockey. Um, but in Germany, you'd probably use handball. But that same American football search term, the football wouldn't, uh, sorry, wouldn't be used as an English search term because you don't need mouth guards for soccer. So again, it's these really little differences that can be the difference between if you uh, start selling your products well or not at all. And again, on cultural adjustments, um, it's about factoring in the different words that sellers, uh, the buyers would use for their products. If you're selling, um, if you're selling uh, flip-flops to Australia or New Zealand, for example, they're going to be calling them thongs or jandals, which of course is a totally different product to what we'd be calling thongs in the UK. So again, this is also really important information to know. Um, and using a native speaker from the country is, is your best chance to have um, the best opportunity to sell those products there. So once you've built this strategy, you've implemented the strategy, it's then important to maintain the success and to sustain your listings over time, continue growing. Um, and honestly, the best way to do that is by maintaining positive customer feedback and by constantly expanding into new countries and marketplaces to keep this, uh, to keep the number of sales channels growing. So customer service, honestly, one of the most important things, and, and I'm not just talking about responding to emails, um, I'm talking about everything from maintaining your health check, uh, you know, keeping an eye on your account health, making sure that your order defect rate's not too high. Um, but when it comes to customer service, you wanna make sure that you're doing it in the language of the buyers. Um, Google, again, Google Translate doesn't cut it here because you, you run into the, you run the risk of a buyer saying one thing and meaning another, or maybe not understanding. If you can't read between the lines of what a buyer is saying or asking for, you can't then convey a proper answer to it. And again, if you can't convey the answer properly in their language, they may not understand properly what you're saying or what you're trying to say. So again, it really helps to have native speakers handling your customer service, um, just to make sure that when the buyer's deal with you that they're getting the best experience so that a they can come back and buy again and b that they're going to be encouraged to leave positive feedback it's also important to remember that different buyers in different countries have different expectations spanish and italian buyers for example are slightly more likely to lodge an a to z claim because it's quite often confusing for them that they or they they often get confused between the difference between a claim and a simple contact um, a lot of our customers for whom we do customer service find that in uh, Spain and Italy, they'll just open up an A to Z claim, which obviously brings an, no end of problems, um, simply because they want to return. So you need to make sure that you've got a native speaker that communicating with them to actually convey the importance, you know, to, com to convey the gravity of what a claim actually means and why they need to close it and how they can close it. Because for these buyers, they often don't care or don't realize how important that is for your business. Um, again, when you're talking to some languages like um, German or when you're talking in German or Japanese, um, it's important that you remember there's different language, uh, different forms of communication. In German, you have multiple forms, multiple different ways to say you, depending on if you're talking to friends, uh, family, or if you're talking to customers. Um, and in Japanese, again, I think there's about three or four different types of um, of address, whether you're being honorific or if you're being humble. Um, so again, native speakers really are the best way to make sure that when you're communicating with your buyers, you're doing it in the right way um, based on the situation. Um, and as I said, also instead of, you know, alongside answering emails, you need to make sure that your customer service team knows how to keep an eye on things like order defect rates, feedback rates, and your general account health um, in order to give you a heads up if there's any problems. If you've got all of your Italian buyers complaining that their items are taking too long, uh, too long to get there, you need to make sure that you you know that and that, that feedback is coming back to you as a business owner, so that you can then make a decision on if you need to change your shipping provider to Italy. 
Um, so again, it's a lot more than just responding to emails and, and Google Translate just doesn't cut it here. So obviously all of this comes to the point of, uh, of account health and you know you do run the risk of course if you do any of these things wrong as Alex said there's always the risk of getting suspended on marketplaces um, Amazon in particular are very hot on getting accounts shut down because for Amazon it's all about the customer experience and if you as a seller are not meeting any of their requirements they'll shut down your account so obviously there's there's a few ways to avoid that um, and these are three that I'd have I think Alex has a really good tip as well about uh, making sure that the VAT compliance is, is in there because you know that's one thing that marketplaces are really cracking down on um, but we always look as well at about, as I said, monitoring your account and feedback to make sure that you're staying on top of things there pretty proactively. Having native speaking customer representatives so that you can really get an idea of what your buyers are thinking and saying. And the final tip, always upload your tracking numbers. As soon as Amazon comes to you with any kind of shipping related issue, if you can provide tracking numbers, make sure that Amazon knows, um, you know, and you can say to Amazon, hey, I've uploaded my tracking information, here it all is. The problem doesn't lie with me. That holds a lot of weight. So that would be sort of a number one tip is always upload your tracking numbers. And as I said, so expanding into new countries and marketplaces steadily. Amazon, great, it's worldwide, it's a powerhouse. It is gonna be a major source for income uh, for your sales in any country that you sell on, as long as you're doing it well. But just like a table, it's important to have many legs under your under your business there. So in the event that you do get suspended on Amazon in, for example, Germany, you have other options to sell there and to make sure that your products are still available to the buyers there. So it's important to keep expanding into the new countries and new marketplaces continually. Make sure that you're diversifying across as many countries and marketplaces as possible. and keep growing, keep more sales channels coming in so that you can keep being more available to more buyers every day. And that is everything from my side. Um, I've rushed through a decade's worth of experience from our side here into you know, a 20 minute conversation. Obviously, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take any of it that's on that. Um, yeah. Great, thanks for that, Jesse. Again, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so what what are the languages that you, you guys can help out with? So we work um, pretty regularly with all of the Amazon countries, um, as well as a couple of extras. So obviously English in British, so British and American English. Um, and again, these are all native speakers that we have in house that are doing this. So different forms of English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Japanese and Polish are our main languages. Um, we do also have access to well uh, to translators and, and linguists from other countries that we don't necessarily work with on a daily basis but if somebody wanted to go to for example sweden um we don't have swedish translators in house but we we do have access to swedish translators that we've worked with in the past and know do a really good job so we also have this external network that we use if, if people want to go to countries that aren't part of our day-to-day -day. perfect great and um, in terms of, um, I really like the analogy of making sure you've got more than one leg under your table. Um, what are the marketplaces outside of the, the big boys, the Amazons and the Ebays, are your clients seeing success on? Kind of, what are the up and coming ones? Um, so there's, if you look at it sort of on a country by country basis, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm going to forget about the UK for now, we're going to talk about um, in sure, Europe. Yeah. So France, for example, France is a really good example where Amazon's actually not as big of a uh, powerhouse as it is in other countries. Um, you know, you've got a very federated market in France for marketplaces. So you've got C Discount is a very good one, which isn't, despite the name, it's not really for cheap products. It's more for good value. Um, so that's actually the second highest visited uh, marketplace in, in France after Amazon. Um, you've also got La Radu which is more for higher end products. It's quite hard to get onto as a seller. It's invitation only. Um, but if you can get on there, it's, it's a very good name. It's one that's been a household name in France uh, for a, a very long time, I think about a hundred years or so. It started off as a catalog. It was one of the first catalog uh, magazines in, in France. And then it's been a household name and then it eventually became a, a marketplace as well. So it's just got a very good standing in France. Um, in Germany, one that's really sort of exciting me is Real, 
um, so spelt like real, R-E-A-L dot D-E. They've taken, um, I like to use the analogy that they're sort of the German Tesco, German Walmart, in that they are a household name. They're everywhere. It's a, it's a shop that you can go into and buy your groceries, buy clothes, buy shoes, whatever it might be. Um, but they've taken the sort of Walmart Tesco approach where they're going, hold, you know, we, we've, we've got um, such a good name here in Germany. But if we don't get into this marketplace thing, we're going to lose a lot to Amazon. So they've done that. And they they actually acquired an established marketplace called Hitmeister um, about, I think, about a year and a half ago. Um, they've rebranded it. They've used that already well-established infrastructure of Hitmeister to basically become available immediately to a whole number of sellers. Um, they link with, for example, Linworks. Um, so if you're, you know, for sellers using Linworks, it's pretty easy for us to get someone set up into Real. Um, and that, as I said, is a, a household name here in Germany. So they are really, you know, it's a, a good one to keep an eye on. Great. That uh, real one is a, a new one on me. So that's great. I'll, I'll take a look into that on them. Um, so just as a final thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Jesse. There's been lots of information there. I hope all the audience enjoyed listening. Um, and like I said, we'll be following up with the, uh, the recording out to you guys, just in case there was anything missed. Um, so nothing left to say but uh, enjoy your day thanks very much guys thank you thank you bye